All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining the live. Uh, today is January 19th in Australia, January 18th in America. Thank you all very much uh, for joining. So um, we have about an hour just doing q and just as usual. So if people can just put their questions in, put QQQQQ, uh, especially if it's not a, like a super chat, things like that, it just helps pop things up. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. I have about an hour before I have to, to go to work. So probably 45 minutes in, we'll ask to stop the super chats and just try to get through everything that we can so that we don't leave anyone hanging. So first question is from Aurora Matera. Thank you very much for the super chat. Hello, Dr. Chafee. Um, how to cure periodontal disease and dry mouth? Uh, thanks and God bless. So well, I'm, I'm not a dentist, so you know I, I don't know perfect ways, but having spoken to dentists such as Dr. Stephen Lynn in Sydney and Dr. Kevin Stock in America, um, apparently, and seeing other people's personal experiences with this periodontal disease actually sorts itself out when you start eating a normal diet, your, your oral biome starts to improve, you stop damaging and inflaming your gums and damaging your teeth. And this would make sense because historically and prehistorically, uh, people had much better teeth and much better dentition. So the fossil record was very clear before agriculture, very straight, strong, well-developed teeth and jaws with really no dental decay or tooth decay. And then immediately after agriculture, pretty wild, mucky, crowded, hook, crowded, crooked teeth, and a lot of um, dental disease and, and missing teeth and rotting teeth and things like that. So, or half rotten teeth. So it makes a big difference what you're eating, what, you're, what you eat, your microbiome eats, your oral biome eats. And when you're eating things that you're not designed to eat, you're going to get bacteria that aren't designed to be there. And that's going to damage your teeth. You know, what animals in nature when eating their natural diet have rotting, horrible teeth. If animals lose their teeth, they lose their life. That's it. You can't eat. You can't defend yourself. You can't hunt. You can't chew grass. You know, you need to be able to chew. You need to be able to eat. And so if you lose your teeth, that's it for you. So that's not natural. It's not, it's very unnatural to lose your teeth and have rotting teeth, even without toothbrushes, dentists, and dental floss. And so just eating a normal human diet, which is just a biologically appropriate diet, which is a carnivore diet, and excluding everything else, including non-sugar sweeteners, then people's dental issues tend to improve. And that's something that people like Jordan Peterson noticed and himself and other people have noticed that their gingivitis all improved and different dentists that understand the importance of, a, of an animal-based diet have also commented on as well. And so if you want to sort of have a bit more uh, involved answer than that, then I would suggest seeking out um, Dr. Kevin Stock and Dr. Stephen Lin's uh, work as well. So thank you for the super chat. Michelle Callie, uh, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. I love your content. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I have a friend with breast cancer and told her about the carnivore diet and its benefits. Her oncologist told her to stay away from red meat. Thoughts, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, look, it's um, it's it's just a common misconception out there, but I would I would challenge her oncologist to find one piece of serious research that would show that eating meat is bad for cancer. The University of Washington published in, I think, 2022, massive literature review looking at something like 800 studies on the connection between meat and red meat and cancer. And they found that the ones that showed a very tenuous, weak, barely link association between the two were extremely poorly designed junk studies, trash science. That was how they described these things, uh, paraphrasing, of course. Um, but they call them junk studies. They call it it's uh, lazy, lazy science. And they found that the better designed studies, the higher levels of evidence found no association between meat consumption and cancer, and particularly not in unprocessed red meat. So that's, it's just, it's just a myth. It's just a 
con and it is not something that you need to worry about. So um, that's how I would respond to that. Um, I would, you know, I, I would just push back on these sorts of things, you know, just say like, be nice about it just be like, Hey, okay. You know, um, that's interesting. Can you, can you show me any research that, you know, says that, right. And I was like, Oh, well, and they might just put out some, you know, platitudes and just say, Oh, well, you know, everyone knows or, 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 you know, all the hormones that are in beef and all these sorts of things. And it's just like, Oh, okay. Because I, I read an article and it said that, you know, unhormone treated beef had about two nanograms of estrogen in it for three ounces of lean meat and hormone treated cattle had about 3.9 nanograms, which is like twice as much. And that's kind of scary, except when you realize that the birth control pill has 35,000 nanograms, cabbage has 400 nanograms and fertile women make between 150 and 180,000 nanograms and soy has over a million nanograms. And so if I, I wasn't to eat meat, you know, what, what else should I eat? Because all these other things, if all these other plants, they actually have more estrogens than, than meat does. And, and it doesn't really seem like it's, there's all that much estrogen in there, but I've heard oncologists say that don't eat red meat because of all the estrogen in it. I mean, th these people simply are, are speaking out of pure ignorance and prejudice. And it's honestly at, at this borders on criminal neglect and malpractice when you're when you're giving wrong information you have no idea what you're talking about and you're just spitting nonsense it's dead ass wrong and it could hurt somebody because you know especially when you're going through cancer treatment you need proper nutrition and that's what meat is so people are telling you go vegetarian things like that and you're just poisoning your body and you're not getting proper nutrition that's that's disgusting in my mind and and it's 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 more disgusting that these people clearly don't know what the hell they're talking about. They have not looked into this. This is just their own pure prejudices and ignorance speaking. And you have no, no place that is no place in medicine. You know, if you don't know something, say you don't know. If you say, well, I don't know about that because X, Y, and Z, you speak like an authority because you're used to speaking like an authority because you're an authority in certain measures. And then other things go, oh, well, yeah, this is what it is. People listen to you. And that's utterly irresponsible and dangerous and reckless. And if it's not criminal, it should be. And so I really, really don't like uh, when that, that happens. So, um, yeah, well, hopefully your friend, you know, watches things like my interview with uh, Professor Thomas Seafried. He's one of the top cancer researchers in the world. And by the way, oncologists generally aren't all that well researched in cancer biology. Sorry. You know, they don't get taught cancer biology. I took cancer biology in my undergrad. That was not a prerequisite. That was not part of medical school. That's not part of residency. They don't learn this shit, you know? And so, I mean, they, they learn pathways for drugs and chemo. And they go, oh, well, this, this sort of works in this, and this is what this cell looks like. It's, it's not actual cancer biology. What's the fundamental underlying uh, pathology and physiology of cancer tissue and cancer metabolism? They just don't learn that. You know, maybe, maybe some residency programs are better than others, but I, I have, you know, a very little faith that they have, have had a robust, deep, uh, you know, education in cancer biology. So talk to a cancer biologist like Professor Thomas Seafried, who's published over 150 peer reviewed studies and papers on this subject. And he'll tell you, you don't stop eating meat. So there's a question from Relentless Heart who says, is it safe to do three, five, 10 day fasts with Hashimoto's? I mean, yes, it's not, it's not the Hashimoto's that's going to hold you back. It's, you know, what, what sort of level of nutritional, uh, you know, what sort of level of nutrition are you, are you at, you know, are you very skinny? Are you emaciated? You know, would this be detrimental to your health to do a longer fast? Um, I don't think that there's, necessarily a good reason to fast further than not eating plants and carbs and sugar and alcohol and things like that. Uh, a lot of the studies that I've seen on ketogenic diets versus fasting, so so-called fasting mimicking diets, which you're getting into the metabolism that you'd be in at fasting. So they're saying it mimics fasting, but really fasting just mimics the metabolic state you'd be in if you were just eating a normal diet, which is a carnivore diet. And so the 
the studies that I've seen, and obviously I haven't seen every study in the world, but the ones that I, I've, I've read numerous studies on um, the fasting mimicking diets compared to fasting for certain endpoints. So that's not going to be every endpoint, but certain endpoints. They found it's just as good, sometimes even a little better with less side effects like uh, no hair loss, things like that. And then, you know, that sort of hair loss is going to be temporary anyway. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that there's much benefit past that. I think the, the majority of benefit you get from fasting is from just not eating the wrong things. And you're just, you're just eliminating. It's just like a carnivore diet. You're eliminating out all this bad stuff. And you're like, wow, my health improved, right? Because you're not eating things that are toxic to you. And that is very helpful. And so people can fast and then eat crap and then fast and eat crap. And they'll, they'll be a lot better when they're fasting. If you're just eating red meat, if you're just drinking water, you're, you're going to be fine anyway. Um, I don't, I don't know of any reason why Hashimoto fasting with Hashimoto's would be any worse than, than anything else. So I would, I would imagine that it's a, it's as safe to fast with Hashimoto's as other things. I, I'm not hundred percent sure on that because I'm not an expert in fasting because I, I don't think it's all that necessary if you're already eating a proper diet. Um, once you get past five days though, you know, people run into, you know, the theoretical issues of, of, uh, refeeding issues. So you just take it slow. If you're ever going to, uh, fast over five days, uh, start eating again slowly, just to take a little bit of meat, you know, always break your fast with the only thing you should be ever be eating meat and, um, just have a bit of it, have a little bit, see how you feel a couple hours later, have a little bit, just sort of ease yourself back into it just to avoid any problems, especially with the long, long fast. You know, some people fast, you know, my friend, um, uh, Fred Everard fasted for 21 days when he found out he had bowel cancer. It worked very well for him. His, his tumor receded by 50%, which is without chemo and radiation at that point, which is massive. So, you know, that was, that was, you know, what he wanted to do in order to help his situation. And, but 21 days is a long time. And so, you know, after that, you definitely want to be easing back into eating so you don't get problems with refeeding. Joanna Hunter, thank you very much for the super chat. 70 years old, keto five months, now four and a half months uh, carnivore. Labs are good. Still experiencing migraine associated vertigo even more frequently as of late. Are migraines something I can expect to stop being on carnivore? A lot of people improve. A lot of people improve on just keto diets in general. I mean, that's been, we have studies going back to, I don't know, the 1920s about then, maybe a bit earlier, where uh, they found very favorable outcomes with migraines. And you know, quite a lot of people recovered and resolved their, their issues. Not everyone did, but a lot of people did. And I think the majority of people did. There's a very, very large number of people that, that improved and uh, and and a, a very large proportion of that who completely resolve their symptoms. There can be other things that you, you can um, have in your environment that can trigger migraines. I would eliminate everything. I'd be as as pure as you can be of just red meat and water. You know, even things like bacon and chicken and farmed fish in particular. They might have things in that from being fed an improper diet for them that, you know, are, are, is going to pass through to you in the meat. And so I would just be very mindful of that and very careful of that and just try to eat just red meat and water and see how you go. Drink plenty of water. Most people aren't drinking enough water. First thing that happens when someone goes into the, the, uh, the emergency room with a migraine, they get put on a, a bag of water. You know, they get just, here's a liter of water. That's it. And then they get, they get other medications as well. So Drink a lot of water, be as clean, crisp, and pure as you can. No artificial sweeteners, you know, no spices and seasonings, and even try to avoid other meats besides red meat and see how you go. Give it 30 days. You know, and the longer you go with these sorts of things, you know, generally the better people's um, improvement becomes, and especially neurological improvement. It's not, it's not to guarantee, it can't guarantee that everyone's going to respond the same to this, but quite a lot of people 
improve their migraines by switching their diet. And then they go back to the other diet and they start having migraines again. So something's in the food that they're eating that their body's responding to negatively and precipitating a migraine. Hopefully that gets covered by you eliminating out everything except red meat and water and a bit of salt if you want it. Um, otherwise, you know, there might be something else in your environment or something else that's going on that's, that's triggering that as well. So hopefully it resolves, but if not, you know, think about what else can be uh, affecting you. Sherry Duvall Cody says, I have no gallbladder. Do I need to take oxbow? Generally not. Most people who ha don't have a gallbladder just may need to space out their fatty meals throughout the day. It's a very common question. A lot of people have their gallbladder out specifically because they didn't eat enough fat previously because they were told don't eat fat or it'll give you gallstones and it'll make you fat and all these sorts of things. Nonsense. Um, you know, bile stores in our gallbladder and then gets concentrated until you use it. If it doesn't get used by you eating fat, it's just going to stay in your gallbladder. It's going to get more and more concentrated and eventually uh, crystallize. And that's what gallstones are. So um, unfortunately, we've all been uh, misled, not intentionally, I don't think in, in this case, but uh, still it, you know, it, it, we gave people the wrong advice and we were given the wrong advice. Um, most people or a lot of people who get their gallbladder taken out eventually at some point will form what's called a pseudo gallbladder, which is an outpouching of their common bile duct. And this acts very similarly to a, ga a gallbladder and they can eat just one big meal in one go and they don't have any problems because they have big bolus of bile that they can push out there. Um, not everybody does. And so I, I don't know why some people do and some people don't, but uh, it's just, that's just what's, what's being observed. So those people that don't form a, a pseudo gallbladder, what they need to do is they just need to um, space out their meals and eat, eat, just eat as much fat as you can handle that's not giving you diarrhea and then eat more fat later on because you're, gonna, you're gonna, still going to need as much fat as your, as your liver is making bile for over a 24 hour period. So you just need to sort of space that out because your liver is going to still make bile. It's just going to just constantly sort of drip out into your intestines and it'll just sort of pool in your intestines and then you just eat fat and it gets used up and then it pulls up again. Right. So that's what I would recommend. You know, if you're going to, you know, like, like one of those Brazilian barbecues or going to some sort of like feast and you're like, I really want to take part in this. That would be the only situation where I would I would think that, you know, that would be what you wanted to do. Because the thing is, is that you, you know, people say that, well, you don't want to overeat fat. I don't I don't think that that's physiologically possible because I think that you, you, you know, your body's not making a mistake on how much bile you're making and you can't really absorb fat without bile. It's very small, about 10 percent, maybe ish, depending on the person, depending on the kind of fat as well. And so. If you're, you're only, if you have a limited capacity and then you have a spillover and you can't absorb anything after that, well, then how, how are you going to eat too much fat if your body physically can't absorb it? I don't, I just don't, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't think our body made a mistake like that. So, you know, it's, it, it does things in exacting details and everything else. And that one, they just, they just phoned it in, ah, whatever, just throw it out there. I just, I just don't buy that. So, you know, if you're eating, if you're taking an ox bile, then you could potentially take in more fat than your body actually wants. And I, I don't know what that does probably just get stored as fat, but you know, it's uh, that would be potentially too much fat. So, you know, if you had, if you had, uh, you know, something that you wanted to like, I, I'm going to have this whole thing. Maybe I take some ox bile. You know, I think it's a situational thing. I don't think you, you need to though. If you have your gallbladder out, certainly not on a daily basis, you just need to be a bit more, you know, uh, just space things out a bit more. It's just a logistical issue at that point. And then again, a lot of people form a pseudo gallbladder. It may not even be applicable to you. So it could be a moot point. So just test it out. You know, if you eat a big steak and you get, you know, the runs, then it's like, okay, can't eat that much fat. You know, how much can I eat? Half of that. That's fine. Great. I'll eat the other half later. Things like that. Malia Neville, thank you very much for the super chat. I took your advice for heartburn and took 
pantoprazole for a week, no improvement, still chronic heartburn, uh, four months red meat, salt water, what's the next step I need relief? Well, you, generally it's about a, a four week course, like a month of, um, of a PPI for standard heartburn, these sorts of things. Uh, I'm not a GI specialist, but um, you know, if you're having, if you take, do take about 30 days of pantoprazole and that doesn't sort of calm things down, it, you, know, you sort of need to investigate these things at that point. Um, if you've got, you also need to think about anything else that could be in your system, you're drinking coffee, you're, you're taking an artificial sweeteners, you have different spices or anything besides just red meat and water, cut it out. You know, you, you always want to cut down to your baseline when you're trying to figure out why is this happening? Why is that happening? If you're not down to just red meat and water, you need to, you need to do those first. You cut all of those things out and you just get to red meat and water. If, if that's still a problem, it's likely not to do with the things that you're eating. It could be something else going on that you need to investigate. So in this case, that's what I would do. I would, I would keep taking it it not for a week, but for a month, that's a, a pretty standard sort of minimum that you take for like gastritis or reflux and things like that. And quite often it can calm down after that. Uh, sometimes it takes longer, but you know, start with that and cut down purely down to just red meat and water. And, you know, and if it, if it persists after that, and it's just really not going away, I would talk to your doctor and, and try to get that investigated. It might be necessary to do a scope and see, if you have a gastritis or an ulcer or something else that's you know separate from the diet because a lot of people's reflux actually improves once they just get rid of carbohydrates and, uh, and spicy food and coffee and things like that it actually improves a lot so you know if you if you're having that persist after that there could be something else going on and, and that would be worth investigating so Thank you for the super chat, Joe. There isn't a question attached, but maybe there's one, one down the chain. Jason Tacoma, thank you for the super chat. I have um, MCAS. I can't eat anything because of food sensitivities. I and I've lived off uh, powder formula for years or for seven years. I have severe histamine intolerance. Health got very bad after my gut got bad. Um, any help? So, well, I'm very sorry to hear that. I, you know, the, the thing is, is I, I don't know if you've tried just, oh, just a strict meat and water diet, uh, red meat in particular, you know, some people have is issues with histamines. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, aged meat is, is, is a bit more of a culprit for that. So you try, you know, things like lamb, but you know, if, if you haven't tried that, you know, that's worth it. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, one of the things that, um, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, has been attributed to, uh, by people such as Sally Norton is, uh, it, it can be a consequence of oxalate poisoning and dumping and all these sorts of things. And so, you know, obviously eating, eating a, a correct low to no oxalate diet, um, can help that if you're, if you're having dumping sort of things and there's other protocols, very low oxalate tea and things like that added into a carnivore diet to then sort of temper the amount that's being leached out. So you're not getting overwhelmed and, and damaged. So it's something that could potentially be improved. I mean, there are people with, uh, MCAS that have improved on a, a carnivore diet. And so you're just, you're just eliminating out a lot of things that your body would react to and respond to. And that's just like everybody else, you know, we have, we, we respond to these things in different ways, but everyone's going to respond somewhat negatively to things that are toxic for us to varying degrees. Some things are not very toxic and we just get a bit of a stuffy nose or an itchy face or something like that. And other times people get horribly unwell and, you know, I have bloody diarrhea for three days, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's variable between people, it's variable between toxins, but toxins are generally toxic. That's why they got that name. And so when you eliminate out all of these sorts of things, at least what you're doing is you're getting down to a baseline of, of just nutrition and nothing that's directly toxic. Now you may respond sensitively to certain things that aren't 
necessarily a specific toxin, but you know, that that's a bit different. So, you know, try, you know, just eating red meat and water and see how you go. And, you know, if you think that there's other signs of oxalate dumping and poisoning, things like that, you know, look at, look at the, you know, Sally Norton's uh, stuff and, and see if you think that her protocol might help you try it out. But I would at least cut down to that baseline of just red meat and water. That's always the default, always the default, you know, if you, oh, well, I have this problem, that problem, red meat and water, nothing else. See how you go with it. And more often than not, this will improve your issues. So, you know, like you said, you have a lot of food sensitivities. Cut out basically everything except meat, um, you know, powdered formula and things like that. I mean, that's that's not that's not fun that you have to live like that because, you know, there's so I mean, there, there's just more and more reports coming out that there's like over 50,000 unique uh, micronutrients in meat that don't exist in plants. We don't even know about how are you supposed to supplement that? Like you're not. And, you know, we have, um, you know, studies with the Akikuyu and the Maasai back in the, in the twenties and early thirties. And they found that the Akikuyu who were, you know, largely plant-based were very nutritionally deficient, but when they replaced their nutrients, and with supplementation, they didn't actually improve their health. They were very sick compared to the Maasai who were, who were almost purely carnivore. They, although they had started sneaking in some millets and corn and, you know, grains and things like that. Now it's a lot more so, and they're a lot more sick. And so people, oh, well, in the 1970s, they said the, the Maasai had heart disease. They didn't in the 1930s. So, you know, what changed in that time? They started eating a lot more grain and more plants. So thanks for proving my point. And so, you know, they replaced the nutrients of the Akikuyu and it didn't improve their health. Obviously, because they were deficient in other things that they didn't even know about. And there's toxins in plants. So you eliminate out all those so sorts of things and you just eat meat, which is what you're born to do anyway. And hopefully that that at least helps the situation and you try to eat the different meats that don't give you, you know, the histamine sort of response, you know, is that, is that a, is that a true histamine response? I'm not sure. You know, a lot of people attribute these things to, well, this is a histamine reaction. It's like, is it a histamine reaction? I don't know. I don't know if we have much evidence of that or if it is, I don't know what it is, but people seem to be reacting. It doesn't matter what it, what it is. It doesn't matter if it's histamines. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, aflatoxin. It's just like you're reacting to something. Great. Don't eat it. Eat something that you don't react to. Um, and so you can do that too. So just cut down just to, to fatty meat and water and uh, and try to just eat the meats that don't give you a bad reaction. And hopefully this, this uh, can, you can get, you can get through this. So Joseph, thank you for the super sticker. That's very kind of you. And El Marie, thank you very much for saying hi. It's good to see you. Evan Hoffman, thank you very much for the super chat. Question, I need to find a new primary care physician. How should I go about finding one that won't immediately just say your cholesterol is high, red meat is bad? Yeah, so you want to find people that are in in the sort of the, the, the ketogenic space. So, I mean, these do exist. If you look for ketogenic doctors in your area on just Google, generally you'll, you'll find something. Generally you'll find a, uh, a website or some sort of, you know, group that um, has links in that. So in Australia, a good resource is low carb down under. So they, you know, they put on medical conferences that are low carb and orient. And uh, as the name would suggest, and, um, and they have a list of, of doctors, you know, in different, in different parts of Australia who you know, would subscribe to, you know, low carb uh, sort of treatments for patients. And generally, you know, if you're doing that, then what do you replace carbohydrates with? It's, it's fat and protein, right? So that's really going to come from meat largely. And so this is going to be, these, these are going to be the, the people that understand that cholesterol was, was a farce and a con in the first place. And so, um, that's, that's probably the best, the best thing to do is, is, is do that. There are going to be different groups and, and lists in different countries in different areas of, of different countries. And so I, I don't know all of them, uh, but every time I've sort of looked and just tried to Google ketogenic doctors in the city that I'm in or I'm near, I, I generally find uh, 
you know, lists of, of people and websites to that, to that nature. So, uh, that's what I would do if I were you. Uh, Joe. Yeah. So I think I messed up the last message attempt. Yeah. So this was, this was on the super chat before, um, Dr. Chafee, what is your opinion on lactose free whole milk as compared to regular whole milk? Same thing, unless you're lactose intolerant. So the lactose free doesn't mean no sugar. It means that, uh, they put in lactase, the enzyme, which just breaks apart, uh, lactose into its constituent carbohydrates, glucose, and galactose. So you're still getting carbs. You're still getting sugar. You're still going to get an insulin spike to exactly the same degree as you would with normal whole milk. It's just that if you don't make lactase, the enzyme, you know, job, you know, the work is done for you. So, you know, um, it's not, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not any better from a carbohydrate point of view. So there are, they're called ultra filtered milks. They probably have other bad there are things wrong with them, but you know, at least what they do is they, they filter out a lot of the carbs and the sugar and they have more protein. They have like double the protein. They are delicious. I don't think I've ever tasted milk that was better than these things. If they could do it with raw milk, I think I'd bloody die. I'd probably be a good thing that I don't have access to that because I would, I would drink it and I would have a hard time stopping myself. I would drink it. I, I drink it sometimes, but, um, I would, I, I don't like the, 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 the amount of lactose in those sort of things, but a lot of these ultra filtered milks have a lot less sugar in general, have a lot more protein and fat as a, you know, as a percentage and as a total number, especially with the protein. So those are something you can find, but I would, I would just strongly recommend people avoid milk. You know, raw milk has a ton of nutrients, just a ton of nutrients. It's fantastic. And if you're nutrient deprived, it's a fantastic resource, but it does have a lot of lacto. It does have a lot of sugar that will spike your insulin and that can cause its own problems. And a lot of people will respond negatively to the casein as well, uh, from an inflammatory point of view. And so, you know, if, if you're, if you just, if you want to optimize your health, I think that it's best to have milk as an infrequent treat, uh, or not at all, as opposed to, you know, something that you'd have daily. Joseph, this is sort of the attached um, super chat. So knee replacement surgery, should you stick with carnivore during recovery? 100%. Um, that, that's a, you know, that's, that's yeah, no no doubt in my mind. So look, you should, you should always do a carnivore diet. You should always eat an appropriate diet. At any stage in a lion's life, you know, past weaning, it should eat what a lion eats, right? Same thing with dolphins. You know, if you're giving a hip replacement to, to a lion, you know, lions should still eat meat. Lions should eat what lions are supposed to eat. Humans should eat what humans are supposed to eat. And we're supposed to eat what we're designed, what we're, what we've been eating for millions and millions of years. And that's what our body is biologically adapted and designed to eat at this point. So yes, you should definitely do that. It will help with recovery. It will improve your immune system. It will it provide the, the protein and nutrients that you need to heal your tissue and, um, and, and make a, make a very positive recovery. So yes, 100%, I think it's very important in these times of stress that you really dial in your nutrition. I mean, sitting on the couch on a, you know, Sunday afternoon, the best thing for you to eat is a carnivore diet. Any more stressful times of your life, it's even more important to, to eat a carnivore diet because that's what your body needs. Um, so good luck with that. I hope that the knee surgery, uh, goes well, or if it has gone, I hope it did go well and the recovery goes well. <clears throat> Lori Palmieri, Palmieri, thank you very much for the super chat. Just got lipid panel done, HDL 43, triglycerides 212, HDL 160, should I be worried? Depends on what you're eating. Are you on a carnivore diet? If so, how long? Uh, what were your lipids like before? Um, you know, HDL women want to be above 50 triglycerides want to be lower than that HDL. I couldn't care less. Um, it's, um, actually in fact, higher LDL has been shown to be, uh, associated with longevity. And in many studies, it's uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol have shown an inverse relationship, uh, with, uh, cardiovascular disease. So, um, I, 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 I simply do not look at uh cholesterol uh, for heart disease purposes i don't i just don't think it's useful 
Um, it's a con. You know, we were conned. We were lied to. This is not my opinion. This is not in contention. This is a matter of record. This is well documented that the Sugar Research Foundation paid off multiple doctors and clinicians and, or, and researchers and professors at Harvard and elsewhere to fake the numbers and make it look as if cholesterol caused heart disease, you know, to cast the blame away from sugar. Right. And so, you know, one of those professors was named head of the USDA and he was the one who authored and published the USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated fat increase cholesterol, stop eating both. Right. So this is a fraud. The, the, their internal memos were published in the journal of American medical association in 2016 game over, you know, LDL is not the problem. So, um, you know, with HDL a bit lower and triglycerides a bit higher, that does denote a bit of metabolic distress. You know, that's one point against you for metabolic syndrome. You have, there's other things that have to be off for you to have metabolic syndrome, but metabolic syndrome does increase your risk of heart disease by a factor of six and type two diabetes increases your risk of, of, um, heart disease by a factor of 10. So that's up there with smoking. And so that shows a bit of derangement and metabolic distress. So if you're not on a carnivore diet, I would suggest you go on one. And I suggest you really do it properly. Only fatty meat and only water. So no fake sweeteners or anything. They, they don't, it's not, oh, they don't count because they're not sure. They count. They are not bad. They are not good for you. You know, we are not combustion engines. Like, oh, it doesn't burn. Therefore, it's eat. Okay, eat a rock then. You know, what's that doing for you? Um, you're you're a chemical factory, and you put chemicals in your body. They're going to have chemical reactions with your body. So, why are you putting random ass chemicals in your body? You know, it, that's not a smart thing to do, and that's not what you want to do. I'm not going to put any chemicals in my body that aren't supposed to be there, don't have a, a specific medicinal use for the situation at hand, should I need it? Or, you know, something that hasn't existed and that we ate and put in our body 50,000 years ago during an ice age. That's sort of my litmus test for that. So should you be worried? It depends on what you're doing with your life. If you're, if you're going on a carnivore diet, a high fat carnivore diet and cutting out absolutely everything else, no, because that's going to improve. Your HDL is going to go up. Your triglycerides are going to go down. Your LDL is going to do what it's going to do. And, um, you know, if you're on a fat, you know, fat burning metabolism and you're having to mobilize fat around your body, guess what mobilizes that LDL. And so guess what? That might go up. It often does. And, uh, so what, you know, uh, it's going to, if you eat a whole bunch of carbs and sugar and pasta and alcohol, they'll come right down. Okay, is that good for your heart then? No, of course not. I mean, this, this is just a nonsense. The whole idea of just the, whatever your LDL is over time, that equals heart disease. It's bullshit. It's complete and utter bullshit. Um, and so, you know, and, and people talk about, you know, it's like, you know, Dr. Peter Atia, who I have a ton of respect for, very bright guy, but I just think he gets the, I think he just gets this one wrong. And he talks about, well, the familial hypercholesterolemia, this, you know, proves that this is a problem. It really doesn't actually, if you, if you look at, at it properly, you'll see that it actually disproves it because people with familial hypercholesterolemia, they have very high LDL and like, Oh my God, look, their heart disease is up. First of all, it's not all that much up. It's only in the earlier decades. It evens out with the rest of the population by the fifth decade and onwards in the seventh decade, there are actually lower prevalence of cardiovascular disease and heart attack and stroke. And they're more genetically prone to clot more, which is what heart attacks and strokes often are caused by. They get a damage to the to the uh, endothelial lining of the artery, and it clots, and that's a problem. This is why aspirin works so well; it stops that from being a major clot. And having a predisposition to clot is going to make you more prone. For heart attacks and strokes and we have other people that have you know other sort of clotting disorders they are more likely you know to clot more they are more likely to have these problems right so we know that and then you look at some smart carrot cookies you know decided to say okay well some of these people have this clotting disorder 
and high cholesterol. Some just have the high cholesterol. Let's separate the two, right? What does that show? Well, that shows that the ones that have just the high cholesterol and no clotting disorder, they have the exact same risk of heart disease as the rest of the population. And it's only the ones with the clotting disorder and the high cholesterol that have increased rates of heart disease. So it's not the cholesterol, is it? No, it's a clotting issue or it's something else. There's there's other mechanisms going on. LDL was never the problem. It was a fraud from the beginning. It was a farce. It was a con. It was a lie. And the evidence shows that. So Louis Roy, thank you very much for the super chat. I've been struggling with scleroderma, Raynaud's syndrome, and uh, interstitial lung disease. I'm scared because I'm already living with an oxygen concentrator. Do you think carnivore will cure me and regenerate my lung fibrosis? I don't think it's going to cure you. I don't think it's going to remove all the fibrosis because fibrosis is scarring and that's, that's generally a permanent change. People do notice that at least superficial scarring seems to soften and seems to get less noticeable. However, it's not going to undo and just make a scar go away. Unfortunately, it may improve things. And I have actually spoken to a number of people with COPD. They do just, just damage their lungs to a significant extent. And they actually find that they have a lot of improvement, um, which is great. You know, and the thing is too, is that you know, if you have a damaged organ, the last thing you want to do is put more stress on it with an improper diet and have everybody having to struggle and cope with that as well. You already have a damaged organ. So why don't we optimize your health in other ways? And so that's, you know, that's, you, know, you don't have other worries to contend with. Scleroderma rainouts actually can be helped. And so interstitial lung disease depends on what's being caused, causing lung disease, but depending on the cause, it could potentially help slow or halt the progression. Will it make it just go backwards and make it go back to, to when you were 13 and had no problems? No, you know, but it can absolutely improve your life in a lot of ways. I would do this very strictly. I would just do red meat, water. That's it. Um, especially with rain outs, scleroderma, those sorts of things. You just need to be really on top of this. And so uh, red meat and water is going to do the best, you know, follow the same protocol that people with autoimmune diseases around the world uh, do and do best with, which is just you know, red meat and water. So the ruminant animals, beef, lamb, goat, venison, those sorts of things, they're going to be able to filter out more of the plant toxins and make it so they don't get to you. You know, the, the pork, chicken, and farmed fish, they're being fed things they're not designed to eat. They're not going to be able to filter that out properly, right? Plant toxins are bad for everyone. You know, unless you're designed to eat a specific plant, that plant is bad for you and you don't, and you may not have the capacity to detoxify this stuff completely. And so, you know, you need to, you need to be aware of that and you need to be aware of that in the animals that you eat because we're designed to eat animals, but those animals are designed to eat something too. And if they're not eating what they're designed to eat, you know, you may not, you may not be getting uh, the, the benefits that you, that you set out to get. So hopefully that, that helps. I would seriously urge you to, to try a carnivore diet and do it for at least three months, you know, hundred days at hundred percent, just red meat and water. If you can do that, it's three months of your life, you know, you have, you have literally nothing to lose and you have everything to gain. So give it a shot, give it a, an honest full trial for three months. I, I don't think you'll go back and let me know how it goes because I would be very interested to see how you do. Chef Bruno Cornbore, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. That's very kind of you. Hi, Dr. Chafee. My wife being a GP is worried that I will get problems with my eyes retina because there is something that is not available in meat that protects people's retina. Um, she did say I forgot the name, uh, but she told me it's not in meat. Um, okay. I, I haven't heard that, um, but at, I, I would, you know, I would reassure, you know, both you and your wife that there is nothing in plants that we have to have that we can't get from meat. There's, there can't be anything essential there, meaning that if we don't get it, we get serious harm or we die because this is how we evolved. And so what else were we eating 
during the ice ages. You know, people say, well, everyone was moving towards the equator. That's a lie that I've heard vegans try to push out there to try to say that, you know, humans are herbivores. It's just insanity. I mean, that's just, that's just dumb. Since when did that happen? You know, so all those cave paintings of salads, obviously, you know, made them think that, that we weren't carnivores, I guess. But um, actually, when the ice shelves started coming down two million years ago, Homo bilis actually tacked up into the ice. They didn't do, oh, good, no, run away. They were right into it. So that's exactly the opposite of what the, the fossil record shows, right? So when you're going up into the ice shelves during an ice age, you know, what are you eating, you know, besides meat? You know, what is there in the Arctic Circle? For the Inuit to eat, I mean, they don't have their their eye problems when they're eating a, a regular diet. In fact, there are a number of ophthalmologists specifically who promote keto carnivore diets, and um, and and that more ancestral primal approach to things. And in fact, they found that this radically helps things such as macular degeneration and other sorts of vision issues. Um, there was a live that I did last month or or so. And uh, some of these questions came up and there was a lot of people saying how they, they actually improved their vision. They actually were able to stop using glasses. And, um, and they, every time they went into their doctor, they were, their vision was improving. They were getting worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden it started improving. And the doctor's like, what, what the hell is that? Um, and so I, I sort of, you know, that was something that I'd seen more and more and more. So I asked people say, hey, you know, if this has happened to you, please talk about it. Just tons. Of people that had the exact same experience so you know i would i would you know encourage uh you both to you know uh, to see things like um you know take a look at, at, at sort of the evidence for that that you know humans really have been apex predators for millions of years and what we're biologically you know designed to eat uh is meat and there are periods of time and there are people alive right now who have only eaten meat their entire life and have had beautiful health as a result of that. And also, you know, what, you know, what are these, um, you know, what is this chemical that's found in plants? Which plant is that available to everybody at every part of the world at all times? Or is this something that maybe is more introduced now? And so, well, you should have this, but if people in indigenous areas haven't had this from time immemorial, and we haven't all eaten this as a species in every part of the world, on every continent of the, of the world, maybe it's not essential. Maybe it's not something that you have to have. And so, you know, I mean, there's beta carotene, but, you know, that's a poor man's vitamin A. And, um, you know, vitamin A, which is retinol, they don't, they don't, it's not made in plants. And so, you know, you actually get, you have to eat like six pounds of carrots to get enough beta carotene to make enough uh, retinol for the day. And some people don't even do that. Some people are, are um, you know, very poor at converting retinol into vitamin A and some others just can't do it at all. So, you know, I, I don't think that that's correct. Uh, in fact, I know that's not correct, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's a legitimate concern. And, but I would, you know, I would just say, Hey, you know, think about it from those, those standpoints, you know, what are the Inuit eating? What plants are they eating? Are they eating that plant? Are they getting that nutrient? How are they getting, it? you know, they're only eating meat traditionally and they were very healthy traditionally. And now they're not, they're not eating what they're designed to eat. They're not eating uh, a, just a meat only diet and their health is getting worse. Same with the Maasai, same with the Plains Indians in America, same with the Australian Aboriginals, you know, the Plains Indians in America, when they were just eating bison, uh, the study in 2001 showed that they were the tallest population of humans on earth at the time. Now they are not. Now their health is far worse than the average American. They have four times as likely to get all the different chronic diseases, obesity, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and the rest. Because they've had 100 years to adapt to agricultural food. And Europeans have had 8,000 to 10,000 other populations similar. And, you know, Either way, 8,000 years is not nearly long enough. 100 years is nothing. You know, there is no adaptation at that point. They're just, they just got hit in the face with this. So, you know, they, they were not eating plants. The, and, and people would say, well, maybe they ate this and that. The, the records are pretty 
pretty clear that they really didn't eat plants. They really just ate bison all year round uh, in that area. If they had it available, if they didn't, then they, you know, they might know which plants to eat or which plants to use medicinally. There is no option for that in the Arctic Circle. So that's why I use the Inuit. Very clear. You're on an ice flow. Nothing grows. So what do you eat? You eat meat. And, uh, and if you're not thriving in those conditions, you are dead because those are the most harsh conditions on earth besides the middle of a active volcano. And so you are not going to survive if you are not thriving. And we not only thrived during the ice ages, we became the most dominant species that has ever walked the earth. So you do get everything you need from meat and then some. And then you don't get all the toxins that come with plants too. Logan P. Smithberg, thank you very much for the super chat. Hey, Dr. Chafee, uh, carnivore for almost two months and curious about your thoughts on hydration and electrolytes and how much hydration affects uh, how good or not good you feel throughout the day. Yeah, oh, I think hydration is very important. I think it's, it's um, you, you drink to thirst, you eat to hunger, you know, salt to taste, all these sorts of things. You have to relearn your hunger signals. So obviously you have to eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. That's what actual satiation is. Um, same thing with thirst. Not everybody realizes how thirsty they can be. You know, I talk to people, oh, I drink a ton of water. Oh my God, I'm always drinking water. And I say, okay, how much do you think that would be? Oh, at least a liter, if not two liters a day. Like, okay. All right. So, you, you know, that's, that's, that's one liter. I mean, I, I have like nine of these a day sometimes, you know, so it's like, um, I think that when I sort of encourage people, especially if they're having symptoms that I would attribute to maybe not getting enough water, I'd say, okay, you know, maybe try to go for three or four liters, see how you go. A lot of times people tell me they get just sort of three or four liters and they say, I just can't stop drinking after that. I get so thirsty. You know, when you get past a certain point of thirst, it actually dampens down your thirst signal. And so your body's just like, okay, we're, we're in a drought. You know, we just don't have access to water. We're just not going to keep bugging you. We're just going to, you know, trim sails and, and survive. And then you drink more water and your body goes, oh, hey, look, hey, we're at it. We're at a spring. We have access. Get more in you, you know, and you and you get more thirsty. And so, you know, that's that's what I would suggest. Just try Just try having you know, something in that level, you know, three to four liters. Just try it. And if you're getting to the point where you're just like, I just, I just can't drink this much water. I don't want it. Fine. Stop. Don't do it. Um. The other side of the coin is, is deuterium. You know, that's something that's that's I'm becoming more and more interested in from the work of Dr. Lazo Borosh and Gabor Somlai. Uh, really interesting stuff. You know, water has different amounts of deuterium, sort of rainwater in the mountains and northern latitudes, quite a lot less apparently. And so uh, probably, I don't know if that makes a difference as far as, you know, people, you know, in different um Historical context is swearing by, you know, just drinking rainwater out of the rain barrel and how this is so much better. Um, maybe it has something to do with that. I don't know. But I think for just normal hydration, it's, you know, just drink to thirst and uh, just challenge yourself. See if you're actually getting enough. As far as electrolytes are concerned, just salt to taste, uh, especially early on. Some people just need a bit more salt and sort of getting sort of fluid shifts and balances and how their body's processing electrolytes. Almost no one needs to take more electrolytes like you know the sodium potassium magnesium supplements some some actually do benefit from that i have yet to see anybody with an actual deficiency in uh, sodium or potassium when going on a carnivore diet on a lab test and i test people i don't test everyone but i test my patients and so i i have yet to see that um and i have yet to see uh, anyone go down on their magnesium it really just goes up when they go on a carnivore diet, especially when they cut out coffee, coffee will strip magnesium out of your body and it dehydrates you. And that's a perfect storm for, uh, cramps. Almost always when people get cramps, it's dehydration. It's not electrolytes. Um, could be electrolytes. It's almost never electrolytes. It's almost always dehydration. And you see people that take a bunch of electrolytes. They're still getting cramps, still getting cramps. Oh, I'm drinking seawater and this, that. and it's like, okay, well try drinking more water and cut down the electrolytes gone. So if you feel that you're having some weird symptoms, you're not feeling great, you know, you can try 
adding in some electrolytes. Never get the ones with the, with the sweeteners and the flavorings and all that sort of stuff. Just avoid that stuff at all costs. Just get there's just the normal electrolytes, and they exist, you know. And just you know, just don't put any of that slop in your body. It's it's not designed to be there. Don't don't do it. Um, and if you find that it helps, great. You know, you shouldn't need it long term though. You shouldn't. This shouldn't be something that your body just requires for the rest of your life. Your body knows how to how to regulate your potassium and sodium, especially, and uh, and you'll get plenty of magnesium in your in your meat. Uh, just don't drink coffee and the other sorts of and tea and things like that that can strip magnesium out of your body. I'm just going to say to everyone, I have about 20 minutes left, so. Um, Please, uh, let's probably cut the super chats there, um, and um, I'll try. I, I'll need to get through these and uh, and get to work. I'll have to sort of. I'll just answer the rest of the super chats that have been asked now, and I may or may not have time to get uh, to any others. So just so you know, um, Rat Keller, thank you very much for the super chat, Doctor Chafee. On day ninety to one hundred, I began getting Charlie horses in my toes, calf muscles. Is this from low magnesium? Can you elaborate? So perfect addition onto the, the last question. It's almost always dehydration. You can check your magnesium. If it's exceptionally low, sure. Um, but I would doubt I would doubt that unless you're drinking coffee, things like that. If you want to take some electrolytes, you can. I wouldn't just be dumping tons of salt and electrolytes and things like that in your water, all that stuff. You know, you, you take more of these electrolytes and they actually increase your demand for water. And if you're a bit dehydrated anyway, and that's why you're getting these cramps, that's just going to exacerbate things. So, you know, a lot of people will, will take these electrolytes and they'll still get cramps. Clearly, it's not the electrolytes at that point. They've already addressed that. Um, it's something else. Try more water. If that doesn't work, you can add in some uh, magnesium or, um, uh, you know, some of the, the unsweetened electrolytes. And that could help, but it's almost always uh, not enough water. So start there and uh, and see how you go. Gabriel Manriquez, thank you very much for the super chat. Do I supplement with vitamin C if I will not be eating liver? No, you don't need to. I've eaten liver maybe five or six times in the last decade. Uh, you don't need vitamin C to the same extent as, uh, as you would if you were not eating a meat-based diet because you need vitamin C to make proper collagen if you don't have a proper supply of collagen and its precursors you do on red meat so you know you don't actually need vitamin c to make hydroproline and hydrolysine you already get that from your food and so you don't need to you don't need to make it de novo and so um you know the amount of vitamin c that you need for other purposes is is minuscule and if you're not eating carbohydrates then you're not blocking out the absorption of vitamin c in the meat that you're eating so what little is there, you get. Um, but you, you you will not get scurvy if you're only eating meat. You just won't. The Inuit don't, I don't, and um, and I've checked my vitamin C very low. <laughs> it's not it was not super high. Now at the time I was drinking, um, I, I just sort of did a self experiment. I drank like three gallons of milk in three days, um, and so that's going to really knock out and not allow me to absorb really any vitamin C. So would it be higher? I don't know. I'm going to check it again at some point, just out of curiosity. But it, it was I had like trace amounts, not bleeding. You know, everything's fine. So uh, you don't you don't need to supplement vitamin C uh, on a carnivore diet. Uh, super chat from Anthony. Thank you very much. Hi doc. I got my. I just got my blood test and my apo b is at uh 129 and my hdl is 207 29 years old athletic thoughts on getting prescribed um uh pca uh pcs k9 um you know i'm of the opinion that that cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease so you know my personal opinion that's not something that that I would personally worry about. Also, the ApoB test is not actually testing the free damage floating around ApoB that gets damaged from glycation, from sugar, from carbs, from seed oils. It's measuring all the ApoB that's there, right? So even, even ApoB 100 that's on the healthy, large buoyant LDL molecules that are not causing any harm in your body, 
you know, when they get glycated, they can knock that sucker off. And they're like, oh, well, that's bad if you have all that. Yeah, okay. That's from glycation. That's from eating carbs. That's from drinking alcohol. That's from having seed oils. Okay, don't do those. And then that will be that you measure just going to be the ones still attached and still working. That's the, the receptor for your liver. You know, so that's how that's how uh, your liver recognizes LDL, grabs it, pulls it in, processes the triglycerides and fats and things like that. So it's not um, it's not it's not what it's cracked up to be. There's a fantastic uh, video by Dr. Paul Mason on um, uh, someone took it as an excerpt. It's just a quick clip and it's fantastic. And uh, so just look up Dr. Paul Mason, Apple B. It's like under five minutes and um, should clear that up. But, you know, I mean, look at the the lean mass hyper responder studies from uh, Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz. You know, they, these people have been on ketogenic diets with massively elevated LDL for, you know, uh, average of 4.5 years and no progression in heart disease and atherosclerosis. Uh, and in fact, the trend was it was resolving. Again, it goes back to the fact that there's a fraud in the first place. And so I, I think it's wonderful that, that you know, Dave and, and Nick are doing these sorts of work because it's just, I mean, people just need to shut up about this. You know, uh, I was already on that, that's that side years ago because I just saw what fraud was perpetrated and what the data actually shows is very different. In fact, it's the opposite. This is very important to our body. And so, you know, I just, I just thought that was a bit of a farce, but you know, people are still, you know, entrenched in their ideology or their, you know, financial interests in the pharmaceutical companies. And just, they just don't want to change, you know, they're just, you know, dinosaurs that don't know how to evolve. And so, you know, that, that, you know, obviously there needs to be, you know, more pushback and more things like, you know, Dave Feldman's work and Nick Norwich's work. And uh, he's coming out with a, with a very interesting study um, that came out. It's an N of one, but it's a, it's a, it's a very well-designed crossover study. And, um, you know, and it looks at uh, uh, this relationship of, of LDL being actual, a, a consequence of your metabolic system and just mobilizing energy throughout your body. So we talked about that on an interview that we had together that would be going out probably next week or the week after, um, depending on when, when this, this paper gets published. So that should be published sometime next week or the week after. And once it is, it's already been accepted. And once it's actually published, then, uh, I'll, I'll post our interview the Sunday after that in America. So I don't think you need to lower, anyone needs to lower their cholesterol be, uh, to, to combat heart disease because I don't think that LDL and cholesterol are a cause of heart disease. And I don't even think they're involved in heart disease. If anything, I think they're protective against heart disease. So I, I would never lower my cholesterol as, uh, as it stands at this moment. So everyone's free to do what they, they will. I don't know what diet you're on. If you're not on a carnivore diet, get yourself on a carnivore diet. And I think that's going to be the most important thing to improve your uh, health and your risk of cardiovascular disease, a number one. There's no medication that's going to that's going to improve your life better than a proper diet. Cameron Fitter, thank you very much for the super chat. As an ex-pro rugby player, um, had a test decline. Do you see any disadvantage with supplementation of ashwagandha, uh, Tonkat, and Deha, or is it D H E A? Maybe. I have dropped you a private message if you'd be so kind to, if you'd be kind enough to uh, respond. Um, okay, was that, I don't know if you'd be able to, to, to see this and put it in the chat, but, or if I'll see that, the response, but um, was that in, in Instagram? If it was, uh, great. I, you know, there's so many different, you know, communication platforms that I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know <laughs> all the, the sort of the, the, um, the, the message requests. I don't always, I don't always sort of see them. Um, but that's great. You know, so tes tes testosterone decline, you know, can happen. Uh, but when I, when I see people on a carnivore diet, I see their, their testosterone levels go up dramatically. And so I, you know, I, I see old men 
that their testosterone levels double or even triple. So it, it makes a big difference. You know, supplementation with uh, those sorts of, with DHEA, I mean, DHEA is a hormone that your body makes anyway. That's like a bioidentical. You're not going to get a whole bunch of other crap in there. If you bring that up to more physiological levels, you know, will it raise your testosterone? You know, maybe marginally, you know, DHEA is a hormone in its own right, though. It does its own things and is, you know, is, is uh, you know, it's good to have in physiological levels as well, you know, just like it is to have testosterone in physiological levels. DHEA turns into androstenedione, Dion, that turns into testosterone, but it's, it's not just a reservoir for testosterone. It does its own thing, just like testosterone turns into estrogen, but testosterone is not just a reservoir for estrogen. It has its own purpose and function in your body. So you could take those things. I don't know the evidence on whether they actually improve your testosterone or not. The thing you have to think about though with herbal supplements is that they're, they're, they may have something that you want in there. They're going to have a lot of things you don't want in there. And so, you know, what are those sorts of doing? What are those sorts of things uh, going on? I would first and foremost go into a high fat meat based carnivore diet. Cholesterol is what testosterone is made out of. So, you know, if people are combating their, their cholesterol, they're combating their own hormones. All your hormones are made out of testosterone. All your sex steroids are made out of test or are made out of uh, cholesterol. Vitamin D is made out of cholesterol, all these things. So your, your skin, your hair, your, your, every cell in your body, your brain, bile, all these things are all uh, derived from, or you, at least used in part uh, uh, cholesterol is at least used in part. So very important stuff, very important for hormonal health. You go on a high fat red meat only diet, your testosterone will go up. You know, you get rid of carbs, you go on a carn uh, ketogenic diet, you start eating sort of, you know, once or twice a day in a short window, your testosterone is going to go up. Your growth hormone is going to go up. You improve your sleep. Your testosterone is going to go up. You get out in the sun for 30 minutes a day, three days a week. Your testosterone is going to go up. All these things matter. If you lift weights, if you sprint, your testosterone is going to go up and your cortisol is going to go down. If you long distance endurance running, your cortisol will go up, your testosterone will go down, your growth hormone will go down, right? If you eat carbohydrates, if you eat processed crap, if you drink alcohol, your testosterone will go down, your growth hormone will go down. So I would address those things first. That's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. That's where your money is. And so after that, if your body's really not producing, you know, a, a, an adequate amount of testosterone, you could try DHEA. It's over the counter in most countries. Uh, it's, it's very safe if you're taking it in, you know, physiological doses. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's over the counter, so you know, you you get to make that decision. In countries that have it as prescription, you know, you need to talk to your doctor about it. Um, and you know, if that's if that's all not enough, and you're not feeling your best, you know. You, I would talk to your doctor about uh, bioidentical testosterone replacement, TRT. I think that's going to be safer than the the herbals, you know, because you're 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 just getting what you want and you're getting the right chemical. You're not getting all this other stuff. But I promise you, if you go on a uh, high fat red meat and water diet only, and you do those other sorts of lifestyle modifications, you're, you're not going to want to use any of those things. I mean, I have, I have patients coming off TRT and they, and they're, and they're actually, they get a rebounding of their testosterone when they do. And, um, you know, people say you can never come off TRT. That's bullshit. You can actually rest your gonads. And then when, but if you, you could go back onto this normal crappy diet, yeah, sure. It's going to be just as suppressed because your, your testosterone is suppressed in the first place because of your crappy diet and lifestyle. You change your diet and lifestyle. You go into a carnivore diet. You start exercising properly, sleeping properly, getting outside in the sun and your gonads are now rested and fresh and ready to go. And wham, you know, it goes right up. I had a patient that went, he was in his fifties. He came off TRT with TRT. His testosterone was 450 off TRT three months later is it, it was like 690 something like that it was nearly 700 so that was that's that's off that's off the um the, the medication so it, it makes a massive difference just diet and lifestyle so that's what I would try first the bush ring <laughs> ring rangian order okay Question. Uh, well, thank you for the super chat. I've been carnivore for three months. I'm still having digestive issues where it feels like I've got too much acid. I take uh, B 
betaine, HCL, pepsin, and nexium when needed, but it doesn't solve the issue. Well, I mean, if you're taking betaine, HCL, and nexium, they're sort of, you know, sort of counteracting each other, right? You're taking nexium that is a proton pump inhibitor that reduces the amount of acid that's put out in your stomach, and you're taking things that increases your stomach acid. So it's like probably not going to be helpful. You sort of be one or the other. Um, digestive issues feel like too much acid. If you feel it, I don't know what that would feel like having too much acid. Generally, people have too much acid, have heartburn, reflux, pain, um, usually when they don't eat. And then we have an empty stomach and have just really intense acid. So I, I, I would try one at a time maybe um, and, and see if any of those help. Sometimes we can have, and I don't know what your dig specific digestive issues are, so I, I can't really, you know, uh, give you more advice than that. But, you know, sometimes people even just have, you know, uh, uh, you know, these, these sorts of issues with, with eating fatty red meat and they sort of get, I mean, I used to eat fatty meat and it just smelled amazing. I'd have a piece of fat. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And I get, a, I'd get an upset stomach. I'd, I'd feel queasy and nauseous. Uh, now I know that that's not bad for me, so I don't have that psychosomatic response. Uh, so it might be something like that. I certainly wouldn't take all of those together at the same time. Maybe try one at a time and see how you go. And um, also sometimes it's just people just need to get used to eating in a very different way. And there can be that psychosomatic response. You just remind yourself meat and fatty meat is really good for you. It's not bad for you. And, um, and so you shouldn't feel Un, we shouldn't make yourself feel unwell as a result anyway. If it's one of these other things, try them one at a time. Don't try them all together. Lindsay Jacobs, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm uh, waiting a follow-up with neurology for an abnormal M MRI with calcification recommendations for using a carnivore diet to uh, benefit the brain. Well, there's massive benefits uh, to the brain. First of all, you go into ketosis and that's your brain's primary energy source. Why do I say that? Because if you have an abundance of glucose and an abundance of ketones, your brain only runs on the ketones. So that's a preference, right? And certain parts of your brain still run on glucose, but the majority will run on ketones if you have ketones available. Um, they also cross over the blood brain barrier ketones do, and they reconstitute into fatty acids, which help rebuild the physical structures of your brain. Your brain's made out of fat predominantly. Um, you're also eliminating out things from your diet that are going to damage your brain, things that could potentially cause calcification. I mean, calcification where? I don't know. Uh, is it going to reverse those calcifications that you have? I don't know because I don't know what, what caused them. But it will optimize your physiology. You'll get into a physiological state, a metabolic state, that you're designed to be in and your body just works a lot better. If you put in, if, if you eat what your body's designed to eat, your body's going to work the way it's designed to work and it can undo a lot of damage. It can't undo everything. There is such thing as damage done, but it will improve your life in a lot of different ways. And so I would, especially for neurological issues, I've just seen staggering recoveries uh, from that. So uh, definitely encourage that. KAF, thank you very much for the super chat. Not carnivore yet, but should people with Miller hypercholesterolemia, very high LDL, only eat a carnivore diet or else uh, they must take a statin? So yeah, so this sort of ties into what I was previously saying. Uh, no, I don't I don't think that it's the LDL that's the problem. And I think that was shown very clearly with, with the studies that differentiated out uh, people with familial hypercholesterolemia and the clotting disorders. There's those with the clotting disorders that had increased risk of heart disease and stroke or heart attack and stroke not the LDL. People with just high LDL didn't have any increased uh, relative risk. Um, so statin's not going to help that, you know, because LDL is not the problem. You're, we're, 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 you know, we're fixing a problem that, that doesn't exist. You know, your house is on fire. And it's like, okay, I'm going to wash your car. Like, what, what's that going to do? It's just like, well, I mean, because I mean, you know, the house is on fire and there's soot all over it. I mean, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, we've got to, we've got to wash your car. It's like, how about we put out the fire? This is a completely separate issue, right? So I just, I just don't think that that's, um, you know, I mean, statins do lower cholesterol. They stop your body from making cholesterol. Fine. If that's what you want to do, do it. I don't, you know, I don't think that it's a problem. I don't think that L, that cholesterol is a disease. We make cholesterol. We're supposed to make cholesterol. Why are we fighting our body's natural biomechanics and physiology? I, I just think that's a bit 
uh, uninformed. And so, um, you know, if that's not a problem, if LDL is not a problem and never was a problem, which it, I believe it isn't and wasn't, then there's no need to lower it, in my opinion. John, thank you very much for the super chat. Gastritis, 15 months, lost a lot of weight, now underweight, six months carnivore, only meat, uh, water and salt, nothing else. 90% red meat, avoid PPIs because uh, how to digest meat without stomach acid. Not much improvement, what to do. Good question. You know, sometimes, well, you'll still digest meat w w even with a PPI. Uh, that's first of all. But sometimes, you know, it, it's, you know, these sort of medicines can actually help. And if you have gastritis, you just sort of need to let your, your body rest. So a period of time with a PPI, you will, you will still absorb meat. It's uh, maybe it's not as good. Maybe it's not as, as um, you know, uh, you're not as well able to, to break it down, but you'll, you'll, you'll still do really well. Um, most people don't even notice, you know, they go on a PPI for a certain period of time. They don't, they don't notice differences in their digestion. I'm sure there is some, but for all practical purposes, it doesn't seem to uh, make all that much of a difference for most people. So I think that might be a good idea to try that. I would speak to your doctor as well, you know, see about, you know, if a pro, you know PPI would be of benefit, you know, go on that for, you know, however long they suggest. And, you know, if that's not enough, you know, probably get a scope. I mean, it could be ulcers and all these other sorts of things that, that hiatal hernia is just sort of, you know, a, a physical abnormality that, that may be causing these problems. So I would, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount the PPIs anyway. Do you want to be them on the rest of your life? No, of course not. But if you can be on them and heal your gut and then get on with life, you know, that's worth it. Uh, Dean Nelsky, thank you very much for the super chat. Do you take any digestion enzymes, vitamins, supplements? Uh, thanks, doc. Uh, no, you know, I, I don't take any digestive enzymes or anything like that. Um, I've checked my vitamins, my minerals they are all uh, in, in great working order. Um, I was sort of wondering about you know, my my uh, folate because that is something that some people can find they have a bit low folate and they just need to add in a bit of liver basically. Mine seemed to be fine with just on skeletal muscle meat and fat. Great. Um, what a bit of you know a, a vitamin supplementation, a nutrient supplementation for carnivores. It's really just liver, you know, and it's not even a supplement. You should, you know, they're just, they're just very nutritious. This is very high dense nutrition. So if you, if you need something like that, you know, I would just add in a bit of liver a couple times a week. Um, folate is probably a good one to check for most people. You know, it is one that, that people can be lacking in. Uh, they may be low methylators, maybe they have the MTHFRG mutation and just need a bit more exposure to uh, folate you know, in its, in its proper form, which is not folic acid in a pill. So, uh, add liver, uh, people, oh my God, liver, it tastes disgusting. It's not that bad. Cook it less, less is more sear each side, leave the inside rare. It's like the difference between seared ahi and canned tuna. It's a massive difference. That's the only way I'll eat liver. It's either raw or, um, or, uh, just, just seared raw liver tastes way better than cooked liver and just seared on each side with raw in the middle that tastes the best to me anyway so that that's what i would recommend for people but no you generally don't need to take any of that stuff um you know we're not eating wild animals anymore that aren't as nutrient dense as they could be if you're getting regeneratively raised grass-fed and finished uh beef you're fine if you're eating wild game you're fine uh everybody else you're fine generally it's just some people may not get quite enough of these of these vitamins and minerals and micronutrients from that just check you know if your folate's a bit low you're not feeling uh as as good as you could be add in a bit of liver should come right up your body should be uh you know well able to um get everything it needs from skeletal muscle meat and fat and a little bit of a liver if if you if you're not quite there Okay, this is going to be the last question, guys, and then I've got to I've got to run to work. Uh, but thank you very much um, for joining. And next week I'll be able to be on longer because it's uh, Striadi 
Australia die. And so I'll have a bit more time because we won't be in the, uh, uh, you know, don't have, have work that day. Um, and of course we have the premiere on Sunday, US, uh, Monday morning um, in Australia, middle of the damn night in Europe. So I apologize. Um, but that will be, you know, always new episodes every Sunday. So if people can join those premieres, I, I like to chat live with people in the text chat um, and uh, answer questions if I can. And uh, but it's also just nice to to sort of watch it with everybody. And um, and it's very helpful when people uh, join the premiere and leave comments and things like that because it it lets the algorithm know that this is something that interests people and it suggests it to more people. So. Final question from Michael Kesselman. Thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee, you're the man. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Um, I like to work out first thing in the morning, but also enjoy OMAD end of the day. Better to eat right after you work out, question mark. Um, like being fasted and sharp all day, but want to be ripped. Uh, yeah, look, that that's a good question. You know, there was a there was a recent study that just came out showing that if you have 100 grams of protein straight after you work out, it actually increases your anabolic window of, 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 of muscle growth for like 12 hours. So, you know, the people talk about this, you know, when I was, when I was, um, you know, an athlete and, uh, that was a big part of my life. There was a lot of trainers talking about this anabolic window that, um, that you, you just want to eat straight after you, uh, worked out that you train things like that. It didn't matter what you ate, just ate. Of course it matters what you eat. Um, but that, uh, you know, but if you ate a lot of meat and thin protein, things like that, you know, they thought that this was, this, this was a good thing. So it's, um, you know, it, it could be the case that, um, that, uh, that you could get a benefit from this. So, you know, if that, that, that study is correct, that if you eat a hundred and that, this was sort of compared a hundred grams of protein straight after you work out as compared to uh, 25 grams of protein straight after you work out. And there was, there was a much bigger anabolic effect and, and muscle growth effect from getting the 100 grams as opposed to 25 grams, which sort of, you know, throws on its head the whole idea, oh, you can only absorb 40 grams of protein a day I mean, or, or in one sitting to utter nonsense. Like, I don't I have no idea where that came from. Again, this is these sorts of things, I've, I've said this before, but there's so many things in medicine and just in the world that have no basis in reality, but they've just been repeated so many times that people, oh, well, that's just what it is. No, not necessarily. So, um, you know, a lion may eat once a week. It's just 40 grams of protein once a week. Probably not. The Mongols, Genghis Khan, you know, they would, they would go five days without eating, you know, slaughtering their way up and down the countryside, eat 10 pounds of horse meat, do it again. They're only getting 40 grams of protein from those 10 pounds of horse meat. Doubt it. So, you know, that, I mean, it's not compatible with life, is it? And so, you know, I eat once a day and I'm eating, you know, two, three pounds of beef. And here I am, you know, I'm getting more than 40 grams a day. I guarantee you that. So it might be a good idea to have something, you know, throwing some eggs or meat or something like that straight after you work out and then have your biggest meal at the end of the day. Um, it's, uh, it's not as, you know, I, I, you know, just because of my old habits maybe, but I, I, I sort of like the idea of eating after I, I work out. I've always thought about this long before I did carnivore, but I thought about this. That was a funny thing. You know, I, I, I ate different ways at different times, but I always remembered we were hunters forever. We were predators forever. And I thought of it as, you know, I always want to play hungry because you're like, you have to go out, you have to make a kill. You know, you always play hungry because your body's telling you like, you need to go and you need to fight a lion and bring down an ox and kill it, you know? So you're going to have more aggression. You're going to have more energy and your body's going to be more tuned to this physical expression. And, uh, when I ate it, body's just like, yep, yeah, nope. Take it easy, sleep under a tree. You know, that's uh, that's what you want to do. Um, and I always sort of thought about it like, well, you've chased down, you've hunted down something, you've exerted yourself hard and you've got your kill, you got your reward, and then you eat, eat your kill and that's your reward. I think you do just fine um, just having this stuff in your system. But, you know, there are studies that suggest that having a big dose of you know, food, protein, meat, after you make your kill, 
might actually have have some sort of physiological benefit, which I think actually doesn't doesn't um, you know go too far against what you would you would expect to see in the wild. You know, a lion exerts itself maximally, takes down a gazelle, it kills it, then it gets to eat it. So you know, is there some sort of physiological setup for us to better utilize nutrients straight after high intense exercise? Maybe. And so, you know, I would, I would play around with that. Obviously you don't want to eat too much or you will be tired and lethargic throughout the day. So, you know, just eat enough that you sort of, you know, get, get something in you and, uh, and, and sort of take that bit of an edge off, give your body some nutrients to start, you know, rebuilding, you know, then go on with your day. I mean, I, I generally eat after I work out, but I often work out later in the day just because, uh, that's, I don't know. That's what I prefer. I like working out later in the day. Um, so give it a try, see how you go. Just don't eat so much that you get tired. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate that. I wish I could, uh, keep going, but, um, unfortunately I have, uh, I have, I have patients uh, coming in in about 20 minutes. So I've got to, I've got to make a run. And I will see you all next week for the live and we'll be able to go a bit longer next time. And, um, and then for the, the premiere this Sunday, thanks a lot, everyone really appreciate it and, uh, have a great, great weekend.